Division 7, ladies. Let's go. Whoop, whoop. On the left side, the home office against Sose. Yeah, I actually still don't really understand how the red team's name is supposed to be pronounced. Then again, I don't give a shit. So I'm just gonna go full on Kaiser Sose. Since the last time when I casted them, they actually had a couple of actors in their name lineup that play in that movie. So we're going full usual suspects here. On the left side, on game number one of the best of three series, we have Ripley on Anna, Galth on Varian, then Metal Panda on Reyna, Funko on Muradin, and Fenra on Kelthas <laughs> with convection on level. The one. Let the memes begin. On the right side of the map, Sose with Shemi on Nuburak, Shimotak on Lucio, Kazgap on uh, Kel'Thuzad, Antrek on ETC, and Tourmalin on Greymane. So let's go. Okay, so I, I have bad news for everybody that likes meta builds because we're not going to see a whole lot of that happening here, I expect. First of all, Dwarf Block in level 1 for him. We get the ace in the hole of the Exterminator for Jimmy. Granted, there are a couple of stuns available over here. Jimmy, by the way, is side laning. Also interesting. And on top of that, we currently have Varian up at the top side. I mean, Varian with the High King's Quest, it kind of indicates that he wants to go into either Smashy Smash Smash or into the Meme Blades. More likely the second, but if we might somehow still get that on, that would be kind of cool. Because we have at least some burst damage behind all of this. The Dwarf already hopping around a little bit at this point. And well, let's have a bit of a look. Down to the bottom of the map, Tourmalen on his Grey Maiden is still playing. It's like, actually kind of interesting. Like both of these teams decided that they would just not use their side laner for the side lane. And instead just simply said, you know what boys? I'm going to put a couple of the range heroes over there. That's cool. Also, ETC going into uh, his block talent, into the block party. It's also kind of interesting considering that you can... Oh, nice. First blood is in. Since you can actually do really, really well in terms of how quickly you get your stacks together for the proc rock. So I think he could have definitely gone proc rock here. Maybe a little bit afraid of that auto attack Jimmy on the other side or the potential twin blades that could come out here. But as it happens, seven stacks for Kathas. As a Kalthas player again, if you are actually playing Convection, and I would never advise to do that, you should try and get this obviously done as quickly as you can for a simple reason. Once that level 10 is in the hands of your opponent, they have a much better chance of targeting you in a gank and taking you out, especially if they're running a setup like this one. So you want to do this before level 10 hits if you can. A couple of things that you can do in order to accomplish that is not YOLO out every single ability just because it's available, because you will very quickly run out of mana and, well, obviously the problems then. Uh, Self-explanatory. Yeah, so he's focusing heavily at this point onto the flame strike. Another hit comes in. That's eight stacks right now. Level four talents give us the smash. And let's have a bit of a look over here. Top side, variant. There we go. Yells around again. That's what he's actually best at yelling. Like, Varian is honestly that old man that stands at the window at some point and just sta starts to yell at people. Which is, by the way, my dream for retirement, just in case that you guys didn't know that, but I think that is absolutely perfect. Now, there's a couple of things that you have to actually consider when you want to do this. First of all, you have to make sure that it is at least on the third floor. I recommend the fourth floor. Anything lower than that, and you're going to run the risk that you will insult someone on the street that can actually throw something at you. So, fourth floor would be something that I would heavily recommend. But I can actually, it, like, there's nothing better than being the old guy just, like, standing at the window and just yelling at people, Ah, back in my day, like, ah! When I was young, we would do that. That is the haircut. This is music. Full on Bill Burr style. Absolutely love it. I need to get like a duplex or something with Trixler together and then we can go full, full Waldorf. And uh, what's the other guy? Uh, Stats, Statham, Stata, Stata, whatever. Um, yeah, you know who I mean, the Muppets. We go full on Muppet show. So it's gonna be fantastic. And again, if there's someone, you know, if there's someone actually that I like, that, I like, that seems nice, and I'm gonna just sit there at my window, I'm gonna be like, ah, oh, stay a while and listen. But yeah, so th those are my retirement plans. It's gonna be fantastic. It's gonna be fucking awesome. It's gonna be great. 
couple of water bombs, you know, right next to you at the window if someone gets a little bit too cheeky and you know you're going to have a great day. It's going to be fantastic. Either way, as we're heading into level 7 on both team side here, we have now 12 stacks for Kalthas. We have 4 only for Mirrodin. So currently he's sitting at only 4 stacks, not really getting a lot together here. We have at the same time now a little bit of creeping going on, on the left side as they're trying to prepare the push. And talking push, where are my fucking Web Weavers? Get the Web Weavers into play, ladies. Come on. There's the turn and it's only 8. Where are those 21 gems that we still need? Yeah, he doesn't hold them either. There we go. Uh, the two frontliners have them. The Red Web Weavers coming down and off we go. 1-2-1 one, one on the kills. And here comes the objective. Let's get the party started and get a couple of Web Weavers into play. Already the aggression towards Kalthas, who's sitting on 12 stacks right now. Varian is yelling around like usual and trying to get some damage done over here. Web Weavers underway, down to the bottom. Jimmy in trouble, but is still able to survive. In the middle, on the other hand, the Web Weavers are hitting ground now. And this is the time to shine, as they are all starting to rush in in the attempt to get a few structures destroyed. Varian has transitioned topside and is working on the Web Weaver there. And down here, we got the Skullcracker as well. As Muradin has decided it's time to get some additional auto attacks in. The rotation towards the top. Stun, double, but not enough for a kill. 11 stacks for Kel'Thuzad. And off we go. Shami is trying to spawn a couple more beetles. Push this through. Jimmy done at the bottom of the map at the defense in the middle of the map. We have Kel'Thuzad trying to do the same thing, but the top side is still getting attacked here. Yeah. And Varian is dead. Gems have been lost. Mistakes have been made. A little bit too far out. The attack keeps coming in. Fungo. I don't know what Muradin is doing here. Like, uh, again, guys. If you're playing that game, yeah, jump gets interrupted. And he might fall. Barely gets out. But again, if you are in that position, ask yourself, what are you doing here as Muradin? What do you accomplish? What, what do you actually get done if there's four heroes at your fort? There's nobody with you. It's only Muradin. You can't really do anything there. Especially if you're going up against two heroes on the other side that have a lot of stuns and some burst damages available to them too. Just take the L, move back and say like, alright, we're gonna lose that fort, but as long as I don't die, we're fine. Just imagine if he falls there. He has more than 20 gems. That's the ticket back into the game. So it's always risk assessments that you're talking about when you're on the back foot. Make sure that you only take fights that you can win. And don't put yourself into a situation where you can gain nothing, really. Really, but can lose a lot. I mean, I know there's going to be at least like one guy that's going to make the up, but Kylo, if he hits a storm ball, that's a stack. That's a whole stack. Yeah, guess what? That stack is not really worth dying for. Oh, ho, 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 that frost blast. And a kill as Jimmy goes down, but the counter kill against ETEC, so he's down too. 10 versus 10. Off we go. Seems like Tourmaline might go down. Pyroblast! Give it to me, and <laughs> there we go. The big hit coming in, and Pyroblast value has been had. The problem is that Kelta still isn't done with his quest. He's only sitting at 12 stacks on his level 1, but hey. Mm, let's see what else we're going to go with that. So, now that they have the Web Weavers themselves, maybe they can push this through a little bit harder and get a few structures destroyed as well. Big question is, of course, still what is Kalthas going to do with his quest? I mean, currently he's sitting at 7,000 hero damage. Yeah, not really a whole lot. So, trailing behind quite heavily. I, which is the moment when I have to say it again. Don't take Convection. Do yourself a favor. Mana Addict is the go-to talent and has been the go-to talent in high-level play for the last five years. For a reason. I make it the last four years. There were some pretty busted cases but still it is the go to talent and for very valid reasons you want to have that mana you want to have that shield sustainability is everything here Varian runs in again there's the setup another stack for Kel'Thuz he's actually sitting at 15 right now and Nuburak is dead at this point and there's trying to go for another kill Kel'Thuzad Muradin nah the lockdown is there ETC is even coming in pushing them back a little bit further and guys, I don't know, Greymint wasn't even part of this entire party because he was already at the bottom of the map, taking the Web Weavers down, rotates in the middle for another wave. There's still a level lead for the home office, so uh, they're doing well with that. 
I still haven't found out, by the way, if their team is German, but I can just assume that they are German and that their team name comes back to translate into people that work from home right now because of, you know, Corona Corona. The home office people. Uh, it's a whole entire new breed. And they are multiplying rapidly. All right. Funko is in. And let's go. Galf is there as well. Metal Panda. And it's uh, nearly time for another turn in. Both teams have enough gems. We need to turn them in, I guess. And let's go. Level 13 turn is in too. Alright, we get again the shattering throw. No Phoenix on the other side this time. 18 stacks for Kelthas. Two more stacks are missing. Six kills against three. Level 13. And the pings have been placed. Take the four down. Yeah, everybody's already running in. Be a little bit careful with this, but yeah, this one is an easy one. Can go into the middle, take another four down, try and work on the keep a little bit if they wanted to. ETC, <laughs> careful, bro. That's the moment when you want that taunt. Nuburak also needs to be cautious. Muradin is jumping in right away. But yeah, Kalthus is also looking still for those additional two stacks that would finally finish his quest. 13 versus 13. It's a bit of a close game, actually, if you think about it. So far, the home office have done pretty okay. But here comes Sose. What can they do? Not really too much yet, but the fountain is down. I'm still looking at the defense here. Here comes the Frost Blast and locks down too. But the Metal Panda is absolutely fine. I actually don't know what's going on with the Soses today. Like, where's Kevin Spacey? He's playing last time with them. I thought he was the reason for the team name in the first place. And now he's actually missing. Like, if you don't have your Kaiser with you, then I don't know the, how this is supposed to work out. I mean, he is the evil genius of the movie. I mean, spoiler alert, but then again, if you haven't watched The Usual Suspects yet, then first of all, shame on you. Second of all, it's your own fault if you get spoiled here. But yeah, you definitely need to watch that movie if you haven't watched that yet. I mean, holy hell. There's the quest completed. Convection is all already done. Well, already 12 minutes in the game, make it 11. But off we go. Good old... That's three forts down. Three forts are eliminated. Okay. What else are we going to get? Damage output. 15,000 now. Kalthas. On the move at this point. Trying to bring the damage back. 16,000 for Kalthazar. Talking Kalthazar, actually. How many stacks does he have? 26. 26. As for another, 28. Come on, baby. You can do it. You can do it. Two more stacks and you're going to have the damage output. Gets completely murdered. Body blocked and taken apart. The dwarf is going to come in. Give him the axe, baby. Give him the axe. Pyroblast. <laughs> another kill. Oh, and the gems are lost. That hurts. Lulcio is running around with 64 gems. So he at least has a lot of them still available. But oh boy, are they in trouble. Now, you could make a play for boss at this point. You should make a play for boss at this point. You kind of have to make a play for boss at this point. And they're going to go for the boss at this point. I like it. <laughs> in case anybody had doubts about that. But yeah, so they're going to come in right away. Try and make this happen. And yeah, in the meantime, this, this is the moment when the red team actually has to make the consideration if they just want to turn in. Because now what... Lulcio could have done is try and sneak down here and turn in and then you trade the web weaver wave against the boss defense So that's something that you can do they opted against it Which if they can defend against this one is gonna be all right But if they can't and they lose the keep then it's a little bit of a problem I mean with 72 gems in the hands of Lucio. That's also an issue down here on the other hand the damage is in There's the frost blast again Kalthazard has his quest completed the damage output is definitely gonna be there Here's the shields as Lucio comes in with the sound barrier. Yeah, they try and go for Muradin. But the boss is still at the top and Greymane is currently the one attempting to deal with it. Get stunned. Yeah, we caught that. But it seems like he is going to be able to prevent the worst from happening. That keep is not going to fall just yet. The push in the middle, that's a different story. The wall is broken open. Uh, it's 16 versus 16 now. And it warms my heart to see an Anubarak player that knows what the only pick on this talent level is. Epicenter. Two melee Anubaraks lately that took debilitation, which every single time makes me want to kill myself and shaves a few years off my life expectancy. 
If it happens too often, I'm sorry, like, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna die next year. You guys are worried about Heroes of the Storm not surviving. If Debilitation gets picked more often, then I'm not gonna survive that. There's only so much my little heart can take. So, with all of that, I mean, you can break one Strava record after another, but if you have to witness that shit every day, then at some point it's just over. At some point it's just, like, too much. Every man has his limit. So, here comes the big hit again from the Force Blast. Not just kidding, but at least connected. And the damage output is about 27,000. Kalthas has taken over, though. He's trying to get the damage. Oh, beautiful setup against Kalthasar again. He's getting toasted. And that's 11 kills against 4 now. The home office. Yep, they are doing actually really well. That's the beauty of home office, you know? Like, most of the time, you can just, like, play a couple of games, practice in Storm League, try and get better at the game, and then just simply tap the screen, you switch the tap and your boss is coming in and is like, what have you been doing all day? Dude, like, I've been working my ass off here. This is like, I've been improving everything, my Storm League, uh, my Excel sheets, and yeah, it's it's been a chore. And yeah, all that extra time at home. So now we have 11 kills against 4, level lead, a little bit more than that, both teams with a turn and attempt. Funko? Yeah, he's gonna jump, isn't he? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Let's get the ult out. They want to turn in and they want to prevent it on the other side. 86 gems for the red team. And of those 86, 75 from Lucio. Rumor has it, Lucio doesn't even want to get rid of those gems. He's like, ooh, shiny. He's a little bit of a greedy bastard, you know? He's opening up a Swiss bank account, depositing all of that crap. He's just like, yeah, I heard that Heroes is actually going down the drain. Blizzard is pretty much killing everything here. The new patches didn't make any sense at all. Why the fuck did Tracer get a rework? Like, what are you doing? I need to save for retirement, ladies. Like, I am not sure how long this shit is still lasting. I need to save those gems. That Swiss bank account is just my retirement fund. I don't know what you want, but if I can summon a couple of spiders and make sure that I can ha live happily ever after, I know what my choice is going to be. Push comes in. 20 would be the dream right now, but they don't have it yet. Half a level. Not even half a level. I mean, honestly, if they just take one more wave down, then they're Gucci. Kill would, of course, help with that, too. They're already trying to move in here. 19. Where's that 20? Where are those Storm Talons? Bottom keep is down. Web Beaver's in the middle. I'll work you on keep number two. This has to be game. I mean, seriously, if this is not an insane comeback, then I really don't think there's a chance. How would you fight against this? Two levels behind, your Storm Talon behind, the boss is moving in, or sorry, the Web Beavers. Not quite taking this down yet, but just look at that core. The shields are falling. There's like objectives on two sides rushing onto the final structure. The shields are gone. Varian is also falling, but that core is absolutely getting annihilated. Winion time, baby. They can fight at the top all day long. It doesn't really matter anymore. This is a win right there. The home office take the victory against Sose. And the lead in this best of three series at Division 7 of Heroes Lounge. Game number two, ladies. Let's go. We have a lead for the home office, and we're going into Alterac Pass. Game number two in the best of three series at Heroes Lounge. Division 7. Bronze to gold. The average level of play within the division. There are a couple of outliers, especially when we're looking towards the top of the ranking, of course. And if you want to check it out for yourself, if you might think about or might consider playing in an amateur league yourself, heroeslounge.gg check it out. On the left side of the map, Ripley. On Deckard Kane, we have Galth on Varian. Again, Metal Panda on Tychus. Funko on Muradin. I've seen that movie before. And Fenra on Kalthas. Hmm. Looks familiar. On the right side of the map, Sose with Shami on Blaze, Simotak on Lucio, Kazgab on Tracer, Turmalin on Diablo, and Atrek on Tacita. For some reason... Kevin Bacon, a.k.a. Kaiser Sose himself, is not here. But Tracer went straight into the parting gift on level 1. This is obviously the reworked Tracer. So let's see if we're gonna go for more or less the meta build over here. New level... Actually, first of all, the 1-2 punch is what we see from most Tracer players on the higher level on level 1. And then we go straight into the new talent for her on level 4 with the... Uh, 
uh, reloaded on uh, level 7. The talent moved away from 16 to uh, 7 in the last patch. There's a couple of things that we can definitely pay attention to. I also hinted a little bit on the discrepancies in uh, the builds that we're seeing on the higher level for Tacita and what happens in the game 7 most of the time. And again, it's the case here that we have a focus into the Psionic Storm and not into Tacita's Q where you're just trying to stack that as much as you can. So that's pretty much already a few of the differences. If you're looking at the lower leagues, it's obviously a lot of mistakes they usually made. Not really the most optimal builds that are being played there either. But it's kind of fun and it's also kind of cool sometimes to just talk about what you should probably do instead. I already am very happy that Kelf has just decided at this time he wouldn't fuck around with Convection. But instead could just go straight into the mana adding. He's like, yeah, I tried it, it was okay, but let's be honest, mana addict is still just the best. There's a reason this talent is just fucking good, so let's go for this one. Okay, Ripley over here in the middle. And Drake is already moving away. I mean the two of them. Murden is coming in. It's pretty much the guys with the beard over here. Mm, top side, Varian. Still rocking it out against Jimmy. This time the solo lane is actually on the solo lane. Ah, last time they didn't really respect that setup too much, but in this case we're actually seeing it. Now Tassadon level 4 with the force wall again. Varian once more with the smash. That hasn't changed either. And I'm also interested what the Tracer's gonna take. And we get the pulse generator. The new talent. This is the go-to that we have these days. Objective is soon gonna spawn as well. And as I already said in the past, if you have, if you're playing on this map, normally you're waiting for objective. Ooh, the lockdown and the kill. Nice. Yeah, usually with the objective, you're waiting for level seven. If you try and go for the objective right now, where you're still level five, it's likely that you give up lane experience. Your opponent can easily stall the objective out with some ranged damage abilities. Wait until they get level seven, and then they get a head start. And you kind of want to avoid that. So it's mostly about just simply letting the slide at the beginning, not really commit to it too early. Wait for level seven to kick in, and that's when the party really starts. Here might be a little bit different. Big shout out already to Tychus. I like it when it goes for the bigger they are, exactly the way that he should. Don't screw around within the rhythm. If you're playing Brawl or Quick Match and you are just a glutton for uh, dings, then let's go. The ding 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 quest sound is always kind of fun. But if you actually want to play an impactful build and something that does some damage, then go for the bigger they are and coordinate your attack with the rest of the team so that you can easily take a target down. Especially, of course, when we're talking about monsters like Diablo with full soul stacks or others. But yeah, a nicely timed minigun is going to do a whole lot for you. So yeah, it's going to be pretty fantastic. But either way, if you do that, follow, al follow always up with an overkill. Get first of all the trade out and then follow up with an overkill. There's the level 7 and yep, off we go. can easily reclaim that, push it back towards the right side and then see that happen. It's actually surprising to me. There's still a couple of people out there that just don't understand how strong the bigger they are actually is. And they're like, ah, but then you don't do any damage anymore later. And this is like, the fuck are you talking about? And this is like, dude, seriously. Have you not understood how this talent works? You come in, you start it up with it, and then you bam, overkill them into the ground. And there is a secret to Heroes of the Storm that a lot of people are not really aware of. And the secret is you have four teammates. You should try and coordinate what you do with them. So, yeah. But with that, let's see what exactly is happening there. Uh, right, here we go. There's the attack right there against the last few minions. Those are gone. Now it's up to the rest of the team, and the stacks are already in. It's actually a great position for them because they only have to hold this angle over here. There's nobody coming in from the side. That allows you to just perfectly position yourself here. And off we go, there's the attack against Kalthas. Ooh, blazes down, Kalthas gets the heal and survives. Tigers is eliminated. And that is a 4 versus 4, at least for now. Varian is already looking tight there too, and gets murdered as well. This is another good example, by the way, of a game where you just don't need Smash. This is one of these big misconceptions that you always hear from especially lower league players. We don't have enough damage. It's like, yeah, if you have two damage dealers near your back line, then you do have enough damage. So in this case, just imagine a good variant taunt 
Tychus gets a full duration of his minigun through, and then the team just focuses on the target. Like, you can blow heroes to pieces within seconds if you do that. So, yeah, that would just be way better than getting a little bit of smash damage out that is just incredibly random and doesn't do a whole lot for you. So Taunt in this setup would have been fantastic for them. And they're getting bullied around quite quickly, as you can tell here. It's three kills against two, and the first objective has now also been locked in by uh, Sose, so they're getting that. They're level ahead as well. You should really get two dice just now. I mean, it's not like they're pushing in with level 10, but they might get it during the push and could maybe jump onto a lane together and play around that. So that's pretty much what we're going to see there. But yeah, if you want to play a setup like this, so especially the home office, for example, what they could do to make this even better is just simply play taunt on Varian and then coordinate the attack together with Tigers. You go in for Diablo, for example, you taunt him, Tigers gets the minigun through, Deckard Kane immediately throws the seal down, you know, locks him in after the taunt is over. You have a gravity lapse to follow up. I mean, there's so many things that you can stack here on a single target if you want to go for it. It's honestly incredible. With Murden, Storm, Ball, Deckard Kane and a CC, Varian's taunt, then you have a gravity lapse, you have damage coming out from all of those. If you can't kill a, tar a target with this setup, if you have taunt, then I would heavily recommend to uninstall the game. But I guarantee you, if you actually try to coordinate that, you will, after a couple of attempts, very quickly get the timings down and then pick up kill after kill after kill after kill. Always assuming that your opponent, of course, is not heavily outclassing you on the mechanical side. But yeah. Now with that said, we have level 11 on their side, 4 kills against 2 at this point. Also the sticky bomb right there. Again, usually you go for the extra damage uh, when you're looking at higher level play. But I love that we have Bunker. I love that we actually see the bunker in play and that we didn't go for some combustion meme over here. So that's already a big win. And in addition to that, we now have level 10 abilities also for the home of ease. Well, I kind of expect Pyroblast again, but given the map, I wouldn't be too surprised to see Phoenix. Now again, as always pointed out, on the higher level play, it's always going to be Phoenix. Nobody there actually picks Pyroblast. We've seen in some edge cases in, let's see, like... B level teams, high B level, or but yeah. Interesting also that we are seeing the Dragon Laser Drill. I mean, this is mostly something that you do when you are considering going into stacks on level 4. But if you go, I mean, Odin is kind of always the better option. And if you go into the bigger they are, it's pretty much mandatory. I mean, the entire setup is pretty much you. You get the minigun through, you get the overkill through, and once that both of those are used, bam, you pop your Odin and then you play around that. So once you have level 20 with the big red button, you have an even bigger power spike. So the Dragon Laser Drill is not something that is really a big option. It's mostly, or oh, it has in the past been played when uh, the level 4 talent, when In the Rhythm was an actual option, which it isn't anymore. But when it was, then uh, yeah, you could play it. Ever since Blizzard changed the level 13 talent, In the Rhythm has completely fallen off. And of course, they changed that like, I don't know, two, two and a half years ago. So ever since then, they com that, that, that change on the 13 nerfed the level 4 as well, totally into, into the ground. And there's some other changes that came through on Tigers as well, that just like contributed to that even more. They tinkered around with the 13 a little bit more too, you can at least now cancel it as well, but still. Tassada is down, it's 5 kills against 3, 13 against 12 now. And the next objective is already loading up again. But yeah, ever since you don't go into In the Rhythm anymore, Dragon Laser Drill also disappeared and it's all about the Odin instead. Which is really, really strong. But, okay, so with that, we have the attack coming in. They're trying to make the play and again, taunt, taunt. That would have given them the kill against Lulzio over here. But they couldn't lock the target in for long enough. The problem is they have nobody, oh, 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 that's a kill. Wah, ah. Yeah, the problem is Taunt is one of the most reliable CCs that you have because it's literally point and click. All the other CCs that they have are skill shots. And that's a problem. Well, Deckard Kane has the AoE, but Muradin, Kel'Thas, both of them have skill shot based CCs. And since this is Division 7, as you can imagine, those don't always hit the way they're supposed to. But if you can literally point and click with the Taunt on the target, that's pretty fantastic. And that allows the rest of the team also to aim those skill shots on a standing immobile target, which makes the chance of success so much higher. But the blue team is heavily fighting now for the position here. It's a 5 versus 5. 
13 talents are ready for Saucy though, which means that the home office are trailing behind in talents, and that's a bit of an issue, and they regret that decision immediately. Okay, this one's taken down, and Varian is about to be claimed, but actually, as it turns out, we have the objective won by the home office after all. Apparently nobody on the red team ever really considered clicking that uh, thing. Now there's three kills, of course, so the question still remains how much damage can they actually do with this now. But let's be honest, at least they got the objective, so that is already a bit of a win. 13 talents are now in on their side as well. 21,000 damage for Tychus, 21,000 for Tracer. And they are rushing around again, this time down to the bottom here. Top side, off we go. Simotak uh, is currently sitting tight here, they're currently trying to defend as quickly as they can. Tracer is already um, zipping around in the middle a little bit. And down here, Tacita is doing his thing as well. As much damage as he possibly can, takes the backline down, that's most of the damage gone. And now they can just simply focus down that bad boy over here, alright. The bottom is down, that leaves only one in the middle, and the rotation should actually help out with that. I like, by the way, how they rotated past the mid lane and just said, okay, let's go for that Tacita. And they did. Tacita down, nicely done. Yeah, five kills against eight. The problem that they really have, the blue team, is they are way, way, way behind in uh, experience. And try to go for the boss now. So that's a four-man setup against the boss. Dibbles doesn't really seem to understand what's going on here. Or he just realizes, well, I can't do anything about it. So why would I care? What boss is likely going to be taken. Diablo is there. Keep in mind, he doesn't have the APOC. They can't rotate quickly enough for this. There's... Yeah, no. Just... Just no. No. No, no. Okay, thank you. <laughs> in Division 7, those are always the moments when you're looking at it and it's like, don't do it, just don't do it. Whatever you're thinking about, don't, don't, just don't. And you, you can already hear the calculation spin. If I jump onto the point, I use my lightning breath, they can't stun me out, my team rotates in, I get the sound barrier, and we wipe all of them and win the game. <laughs> and it never goes down that way. So, yeah, good for him. Over here though, they go for the boss defense. No rotation towards the top. Objective is of course about to be up again. Uh, we're gonna soon TM. See here. But yeah, let's see how this is gonna work out now for the red team. Because they kind of lost a little bit of the advantage that they had in experience. They can finally take this one down here. So another four destroyed. The one in the middle is also incredibly low, so there's another chance. Uh, yep. There we go. Another cap, and this time they can go for it. And you know who's missing? Tychus is missing. <laughs> Varian is yelling again, but he's also just dying. And that's a camp. That's a freebie, and that's a double kill. That's a triple, baby. Varian, Muradin, and Kalthas are down. The camp is taken. Level 17, nearly 18 against 16. And yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's a free objective. That's the camp that is pushing. That's the potential push into the middle of the map to take the fort down because the minion wave is going to be stopped here for a little bit, which allows this one to push in. Tracer has taken good care of it. Zip! That fort is down. The team moves topside and says, like, let's go for the boss. There's three heroes that are still dead. So let's take it all. And indeed they do. There's just no way for the red team to do anything about it. Diablo is currently sitting down here and is trying to prevent that. He needs to be careful. He could be locked down, but then again, they don't have Taunt. So, yeah. Yeah, he can just move away. Imagine a Taunt here. Charge, Taunt, and then he comes in and Diablo dies. Might still, might still, and he does. Sound barrier is too late. Okay, nearly escaped though. Nearly escaped. Yeah, 6 kills against 12, so a little bit of greedy from him. But now, of course, you have to defend the top. Which means, even with a kill against Diablo, who's, by the way, now back because he had 100 stacks on the souls. Uh, even with that, can't really do a whole lot about it. So now they move down to the bottom of the map. As they're trying to uh, go for this one. Final 9 seconds. How much is that boss gonna do? Not really a whole lot, if you're honest. Maybe he gets a tower down. Maybe two. Not too much. Only question is really how much does the objective itself do now. 12 kills against 6 gives you a pretty solid idea of who's winning teamfights here. 
if they have a shot of maybe getting a kill with this. If they get level 20. I mean, there's a lot of ifs here, but if they are able to just get a few more waves, get that 20 with a push, ooh, that would make for a spicy pressure play. Okay. Yeah, and they're trying to get it right here. In the middle. A little bit disproportional, by the way. The tracer mount plus tracer on top of it. I'm not quite sure if you saw that already, but it's like... Yeah, I don't know. That's pretty big. Anyways. Yeah. Alright, Tracer, baby. Let's go. Top side. <laughs> yeah, sorry, but that's gone. <laughs> and they have 20 with it as well. It's the dream. The absolute dream. Even the one in the middle has taken damage. They can easily rotate middle now. I don't know if you can go for core here already, considering that the boss still has two armor shields. But you should be able to make a rotation into the middle, take a second keep here. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, well, I should probably specify a little bit. With a minion wave. We need to rotate a little bit, uh, a little bit sooner. Here's the thing. If you already see that your objective plus the boss is taking down the top keep, you don't have to keep your entire team there in order to get that done. Once that you're sure that the defense can't take it down anymore, you can rotate away. You don't have to actually like watch it fall. You can rotate into the middle before that and then take a position there and let your opponent try and defend their core. So that's oftentimes much better here. That's a good kill though. Kalthas down. Nice shot from Tassada. That was nicely done. And yeah, the counter kill against Diablo on the other hand, that's not really all that great for the red team. So say also with a very, very low HP tracer. As she's rushing away now. The only one that hasn't died here, by the way, is Lulcio. He's been lulling around quite a little bit. Another kill. This time Tassada is the one that bites the dust. It's boss up at the bottom of the map. Three seconds! Yep, there we go. Boss is up. And they're gonna go for it right away. So it's a little bit of a back and forth here. Top side, of course. Keep is gone. Fort's still standing for the red team, which means continuous catapults against them. 17 minutes in. Eh, not really too bad yet, but once that we're hitting the 20 minute mark, 20, 21 minutes, then it's gonna get a little bit more nasty. Come back time, baby. <laughs> this is the moment when you turn it around. Or not. I mean, with the level 20, we also no, have no fortified bunker, by the way. We got the burn notice over here. And Tassada went into the Kala's gift. Okay, down to the bottom of the map. What are we gonna get here? Ah, uh, Funko is doing <laughs> Hits the Stormbolt and the Minion. That's pure frustration that you haven't completed your quest yet. Yeah, top side Kalthas is currently trying to defend this. With catapults, by the way, I mean those gnolls over here. So, yeah. Yeah, Tassadar's back too. Now, they should probably try and get control of this. 20 is ready on both sides. What is that shit? Unstoppable force? Where's my rewind, baby? Dude! Presence of mind? <sighs> I don't know. Not so sure about that. Boss at the bottom. Yeah, it's not going to get too much damage. They need to go topside now. They need to defend this. They need to make a play here. Or it's going to become problematic. 13 kills against 8. It is time to boogie, baby. Yeah. This objective could honestly... Uh, if the red team takes it, it could decide the game. If the red team wins the objective, it could legitimately be the end of this. But can they? That's the bigger question. Already, Muradin with a jump, with a storm bolt, stunned into the wall. Here we go. Stay a while. And get wrecked. But nobody's getting wrecked over. Oh, well, actually, that's not quite true. Oh, the value of the pyroblast. <laughs> nothing. Absolutely nothing. Did the Pyroblast get any value? Nine, 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 nine. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Top lane, on the other hand, could actually pressure this a little bit more. And talking about lanes, the one in the middle is also getting attacked here. It's still a four versus four now, and the teams are trying to go for the objectives. Trying to make a little bit of a play right now. But let's see. Mid lane, they're defending this. Key took a little bit more damage. That's about that. And off we go, top side. Take the dwarf! Take the dwarf down the wall! The wall is in! <laughs> yeah! Get slapped to death right there! Murden is dead! Yay! Shut the fuck up, you're not even in the game! 
Ugh. Fake dragons everywhere. Nine kills against 15. Uh, level 21 on the board, 20 minutes in. And top side boss is about to be taken now too. So guys, it seems like this could actually be the push for game. With the objective taken, with the top attacked here. <laughs> Did that thing just leash? <laughs> uh, that was a fail. <laughs> yeah, we'll try that again. We'll try that again. This time they're going to get it. I believe in you, boys. I believe in you. Now, the objective is already on the way, but I have no idea how the blue team is supposed to hold this. There's already mad pings at the bottom of the map, and for good reason. I mean, this wave is massive. Absolutely massive. Mid lane, that's what we currently have. Yeah, well, the camp pushing is through. Good luck with... Where are you going? What are you kids doing? Seriously? Really? Mid lane? Really? That's the lane that you're worried about? That the wave takes two of the turrets down? While you have a boss and this pushing topside 21 minutes in? You're worried about the middle of the map? Okay. Okay. Game's gonna end anyways. So they get the catapult, but yeah. We need to get all the keeps. Get all the keeps. Every single keep. This gets, gets the extra experience. You need to go for it. You need to go for all the keeps. There's no camp on the map. So there's only one thing to kill, and that's the core. And yeah, guys, this is of course the game. We're gonna go game three. Game three between the home office and Sose as the rest team, red team locks in a victory on Aldrich Pass. Game number three, final map in the series here in Division 7. And let's go on the left side on Battlefield of Eternity. We got the home office with Ripley on Oriel. Gelf again on Varian for the third time in the row now. The Metal Panda on Suljin. Funko on Muradin. And Fenra on Tassada. Again with the Psionic Storm not going into the build that we see on the higher level. To the right side of the map, Sose with Shemi on Johanna, Simotak on Reika, Etrek on Liming, Tourmaline on Diablo, full on double tank setup, and we got Cas Gap on Greymane. With Force Armor on level 1 for Liming. Alright, let's go and see which team takes it here. Yeah, Suljin is actually kind of funny to see in the game here. It's actually something I didn't really expect to be absolutely honest with you. Where's Jimmy with his exterminator? Where's Vala, for example, with her arrow build? Where are all these heroes? Where's a Hanzo that can simply come in and burn that immortal down quickly? There's a lot of stuff missing over here. And I don't know, is that Suljin going to be the one that turns it around? Will Varian this time get his value again? Or is that front line a little bit too hard for them to break through? This is another one, by the way, of those games where I'm just eyeing down that Johanna on the other side. Um, I'm a little bit worried that the only reason why Johanna was played is that they felt they needed something to blind Suljin. I really hope that wasn't the case here. Because, again, there is nothing worse than if you think you have to pick a blind against an auto-attacker. It's absolute bullshit. Don't do that. You're ruining your compositions if you're trying to do that, and it doesn't do anything for you. If anything, stack stun. And it's already a problem that Johanna is at the bot lane. Why is it a problem that Johanna is at the bot lane? Very simple, because it means that Diablo is at the top lane. Diablo shouldn't be here. Diablo is not winning this. Well, okay, let's rephrase. Diablo should not win this. Because this is a setup where if you put Johanna topside, at least she has Condemn. You can also go into Laws of Hope on level 1 and give her a little bit more self-sustain so she can, in a pinch, make her an um, offlaner. Diablo is definitely not a hero in that position. And the only reason that I can actually see, and I'm guessing here, of course, why they put Johanna in the bot lane instead of putting her where she would belong here, top lane, is they actually feel that they need the blind against Suljin. And again, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible reason. Don't do that to yourself. I don't know why this meme doesn't die. That against auto-attackers on the other team, you need a Lili for blind. You need Natanis ult. Or you need a Johanna. I'm of course assuming that's what happened here, but even if it didn't, that meme just doesn't die. And I hear the explanation so often when people ask on how to improve in the lower levels, and it is mind-blowing. So don't fall into that trap. If you want to stack anything against an auto-attacker on the other side, just stack stun. 
just stack stun and take those heroes down. It's the best thing that you can do. Forget about this blind. It's nice to have a blind in an addition, but uh, the blind is always uh, like, ooh, it's nice to have that too. It's never the reason why you actually pick a hero. Nobody picks a hero because they say like, oh my god, we need the blind here. You pick a hero and then you're like, oh my god, it's nice. That hero also has a blind that we can use. So that's another one. So, yeah, super important here. And normally, of course, you don't really want to walk around with two full tanks, but you want to have on the offlane someone that does a little bit more damage. But either way, that's enough about compositions and about what I think happened in draft here. So let's see a little bit on how it plays out. It's still Division 7, so uh, compositions doesn't necessarily mean too much. But, of course, it's nice to set yourself up with the best possible... Uh, initial situation to win something like this. But the damage is already coming in. Someone just gets stunned by the Immortal, but the halftime show is already over. We have, in terms of talent, again, the Smash for Variant. Don't really feel we have to go over Taunt as the proper play anymore, but yeah, covered that already in the previous games, I suppose. But that was a nice stun combo, actually, and oh my god, Muradin barely making it out. It's a pretty tough one here, but it means also that the damage has to come very heavily from the two backlines, which shouldn't really be a problem. I mean, you have a Greymain, you got a Li Ming, both of them are also good on the Immortal as well, Greymain in particular, but Li Ming is nice for these stalemate situations where she can simply just throw a couple of globes and the opponent has to decide whether or not she only wants to soak that up or they don't want to. But either way, here comes Varian again as he's trying to move in. Suljin, by the way, has by now four stacks. This is a weird one for Suljin anyways, because Suljin is now the one attacking the Immortal when Suljin kinda wants to be the one attacking the opponent so that he can stack and be strong for the late game. So seeing him in a position where he's the main damage against the Immortal is a little bit awkward because it does nothing for his baseline. I mean, absolutely nothing. Neither for the baseline nor for the level 1. If you want to have that Suljin as a hero in the game, you want to pick that hero because you're brawling. He is a pretty bad pick just in general. I mean, I think in Meta Madness we've seen him... Did we see him? I don't think we've seen him once. But even if we saw him once, I mean, out of, out of, the, out of, out of all the games, even when there was 56 heroes banned, Suljin was pretty much not reliably picked which tells you exactly where he is in uh, the order of uh, heroes that bring any use to the game. If you want to have auto attackers there, your Vala, your Jimmy, Phoenix even, would probably be the better choices here and could really help you out a little bit with all of this. But if you want to have a Suljin, so if you, despite all of that, still say, nope, Suljin's our boy, then what you want to do is you want to be the one attacking the opponent. You want to be the one attacking, you want to stack your level 1, you want to get some kills in for your level 1, and that's kind of important. So you shouldn't really be the hero that at the beginning of the game all of a sudden finds himself during an immortal phase just hitting the immortal the entire time. That doesn't do anything for you, that doesn't help you for the late game. If anything, you want to start doing that when you are already stacked, when you already have a bit of a punch to all of this. Now Li Ming going into an orb build over here. Again, as we said in the past, it's all about the Calamity and then the level 13 talent if you really want to get better at the hero. If you want to go into a build like this, play a different mage would be my advice. If you really want to get the most out of Li Ming, you have to go into Calamity. It gives you an additional damage spell and it is absolutely fantastic what you can do with it, especially if you have a good front line that can shield you there. But we'll see where they are going with this. So, Muradin, he is already heading into a little bit of jump shenanigans, which means that he also has a chance to later on attack Li Ming if she decides to go into Glass Cannon, which is, of course, a horrible mistake to make. But we sometimes see that. Now, uh, Aureal here also, straight up on the whip the entire time. Yeah, and here we go. We have our next Immortal coming up. Currently, we're looking at 8 stacks on Suljin. He wants to, of course, have a range increase, which means another 7 stacks, and he's going to have that slight increase. If he completes his level 1, that's going to be added to it. All right, here we go. Oriel comes in and... Yeah, gets a whip. Straight into the wall. Li Ming gets stunned here. And the kill against Tassadar. The red team absolutely on a tear right now, but Greymin at least gets taken down as Varian comes in. Yeah, gets put in a little bit of a corner. I mean, that's a body block and a half right there. Suljin still wants to go for the attacks. Stop running around too. You got range enough to attack over this. Yeah, a little bit of damage here. And he really wants to die, doesn't he? I mean, he just committed Sudoku, uh, like, hard. They get the camp, though, and they even lock the Stormbolt in against Li Ming. If they can follow up a kill here, that would be great. And Varian makes it happen. Yes! Comes in and they get it. 
Now Suljin is at 11 stacks now and he got 3 stacks for his level 1 which means 6% extra damage, that's good for him. That's actually quite nice. And... well... Let's have a bit of... Uh, look, 5 kills against 3. We have 10 kills against... Uh, sorry, level 10 against level 9. Haymaker! <laughs> Oh, <laughs> Aegis and Suljin also has this quest there. It's a little bit awkward because I can already predict that we at least have one situation coming up where Suljin is about to die, pops his Taz Dingo, and then all of a sudden Aegis comes in from Oriel. You just wait, it will happen. So it definitely will happen. I would have gone into Resurrect probably before I do that, or they have to communicate well, which is also possible. This is a big shield, by the way, 100% shield right there. So, it's pretty brutal. Okay, let's see what else they can get here. Defense topside gives another opportunity to Suljin to stack his his own attack. Yeah, he needs to get that range increase. There's the Bloodlust, I like it. Bloodlust has been become the staple. Division 7 was a bit late to adapt to that, but now we have Bloodlust together with Raymane, so that's good. You just have to pick their moment, of course. There's already the Haymaker, a little bit of a setup, Stormbolt, nice, good, Cleanse comes out too, nicely done by Rhaegar, well done. The keep is down, uh, the fort is down, and they can even attack the keep, honestly at this point I would try and push this a little bit further. You don't want to overstay your welcome here, don't get me wrong, but if you still have shields available like hell, look, you are going to make a bit of a play. Open that wall up. Give Suljin an opportunity to get some additional stacks together. Which right now he doesn't really do though. A few more hits. Come on, baby. You can do it. Let's be careful here. Shouldn't really stay too long. At this point, you kind of want to fall back. You can't really gain anything there anymore. Alright. Oh, level 13 talents. Still level out. Damage output. Varian, uh, 17,000. Suljin at 15k. Li Ming at 19,000. So far, so good. Uh, 12. Let's go. Over here, zero deaths and a couple of heroes. The two supports and Muradin have not died yet. The whip into the wall again. Haymaker! Suljin! And pops his ult, gets the kill, and gets a couple of stacks. And here's the Aegis! <laughs> I told you it would happen. I told you it would happen. Aegis comes in just as he pops his ult. Oh, of course, why wouldn't it? And that's exactly the problem. Exactly the problem. Yeah, honestly, like, uh, that was... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that was the easiest call of my life, seriously. That's the reason why Resurrect would have probably been the better option. Or, of course, you go Guillotine. Those are your two options. Generally speaking, I'd say don't go Guillotine, but in this setup, maybe. Okay, 15 stacks for Suljin. It was also a good kill because he got Rhaegar, which previously hasn't died yet. I uh, hadn't died yet, so that is uh, now a near completion on the Headhunter, and he has a range increase through his, his 15 stacks on the baseline. Once that he has the 13, he's gonna get the double swing on uh, the Axis, but he didn't go into the Arcanite Axis, we actually have him on Ferocity. So that means that he doesn't get the stacks on his level 7. Fair enough, going into a bit of a different build, but that makes it even more important for him to get the auto attack damage co connected with uh, through the baseline now and one additional stack of course for the headhunter is also gonna mean he will increase his range even further which is making it really easy for him to keep stacking now Muradin should probably defend this a little bit as Greyman is the only one over there just simply a stormball and hopping out would do a lot of work here rest of the team is already burning it down to 50% though and they're getting it quickly uh, it kills against three now as so everything else is rotating in Push to the top, trying to get a bit more experience. You have level 13 talent advantage. I mean, they should really go for it. At this point, you still have a talent advantage over your opponent. It's not going to hold for long, so Li Ming is going to take that for the team now. So that was the chance to get a bit more work done here. And let's see what Li Ming takes. Is that going to be one of those glass cannon games again? Then Muradin needs to be on her ass together with Suljin the entire... Sorry, with uh, Varian the entire time. But nope, not quite. Illusionist gets taken. Also, the tidal waves, again, talent opened up after the level 10 ability shifted away from ancestral healing into bloodlust because now you don't need your shield, your earth shield on level 13 anymore to bridge the gap for the short, uh, for the short wind up of ancestral healing. So now you actually have the option to go into a different talent without losing out too much utility there. Yeah? 
Zulgen comes in as well. Come on, it's time to troll a little bit. Yeah, get some damage in. He's a little bit focused on that Li Ming, to be absolutely honest with you. And they start to get the kills over here, but Aurel is also dead. Zul'jin... Yeah, there it is. Why did he press the R button? The fuck just happened? He just got blown up by Li Ming. He didn't even pay attention to that, apparently. So he doesn't pick his ult. That's a little bit of a uh, miss right there. That's a 3-2-3 moment if I've ever seen one. Big F from my end for that play. I mean, just hit that R button and go for it. You don't have to hit it at the last second. That was a great opportunity for him to get at least two, three kills. He got one, but damn, that didn't work out for him. 18 to 4, what we're currently looking at. Well, 18 and 4, the two stacks over here. But now they lost the Immortal and they lose the Cam. This is a bit of a comeback territory here from Sose. The beginning of the game looked actually quite nice for them, but now can Sultan actually take this here, or how, how is this gonna look? I mean, again, they are trying. Uh, nobody is actually pushing with this. They are a little bit slow on this entire endeavor. That immortal is already starting to get murdered, and I don't think they, they might not even get the fort. Li Ming isn't even here. God knows why Li Ming isn't here. Apparently we're thinking to get the early level 16. I, mean, I don't really know why. Muradin, on the other hand, I mean, he picked Haymaker. Yeah, there's the Aegis. That helps him. Sojin comes in. More damage. And that's a Jojo kill. Jojo is down. Gets more damage in as well. Needs to be a little bit careful right now. Good use of the ult this time. 20 stacks on his level 1. And the kill against Li Ming and against Diablo. There's Mr. Smashy Smash Smash again as Varian jumps in. That's 13 kills against 7. Yeah, and they're looking fantastic with this. Looking actually really good right now. And I'm um, coming back to one of my previous points. What is that blind doing at this point for the red team? Exactly. Jack shit. Absolutely nothing. If you have instead of Johanna another an actual side laner that has a reliable stun, not just a blessed shield, aka a 60 second cooldown on a heroic, but a reliable stun plus a little bit more damage in that situation, you get way more value against not only Suljin but against every other hero in that setup. Now that doesn't mean that uh, Johanna is a bad hero, of course she isn't, and Johanna is fantastic. But Johanna paired off with the Diablo just puts you in a spot where your frontline doesn't really have that much damage. And if the thought process here really was, hey, we need a blind, then you can see that this doesn't work out at all. He still has 30,000 damage. It's a little bit less than Varian, who's just like smashing around the entire time, but that's solid damage output. And we're talking about a 15 minute game so far. If we're heading into the late game here, where he has more stacks available on his baseline, that would of course also increase the damage output that we're seeing from of that troll. So definitely uh, a really good example of how you should not play that out. But this isn't over yet for Sosei. They still have tools available that they could use. And if they get an insta blow up as one of these fights starts, then they have a chance of turning this all around. So there's an opportunity. Okay, so let's see if we're getting a little bit more over here with the halftime show just murdered. Muradin? Yeah, they're, they're, they're getting this one. This is a problem, by the way. You kind of need to deal with this now, because with the minion wave coming in and the minion wave over here, yeah, if you don't deal with that, that top keep is maybe not falling, but it's going to be incredibly low. So level 1 isn't completed yet for Soldier. still needs to get one kill. He missed out on one of the earlier ones. But off we go. There's the kill. No, the heal! Suljin goes down. Varian as well. Can the red team maybe make it happen? There is the immediate kill against Diablo. Uh, Tassada is down too though, so despite the initial aggression here, this one is still up for grabs. Top side, there's still two remaining of the camp. Again, time is working against them. They're trying to burn this one down, but there's also of course a few heroes that are attempting a defense. Oriel and Muradin are the only survivors, this is a little bit of a problem. They don't have an actual damage dealer over here. Still playing around this though. A little bit of damage is done, the problem is still that top lane. And, yep, the fountain is already down. The keep takes more and more damage. I don't think it's gonna fall, but it will be very low. There's still a level lead for the blue team, and the more time they buy here, and of course the more they reduce the hit points on this immortal, the better their chances for defense later on. 22 stacks for Suljin. Again, it's not crazy what he has. As I said previously, it's not really your 
prime hero you want to take there. Diablo actually moving back in order to defend, which is also pretty good because with the catapult now moving into the keep would have actually fallen. So Suljin is moving in as well. Mm -hmm. Trying to take that on. Taking the camp here, I mean they get it. Alright. But now it's time for the top defense. Now Fort should be a goner. I don't really think they can hold the fort. But it seems like they are going to try and take the fight here. Yeah, Varian, I am not quite sure what you are doing, bro, but you are a little bit too aggressive here. Yeah, Oriel saves him, though, and they get Greymane. And now he is still fighting on... Oh, that's a kill! But no, 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 Bloodlust! Kiddly Ming, what are you boys doing? There we go. No, <laughs> she's still alive! And Suljin is dead. I can't, even, I can't believe how this fight is turning out right now. Yep, Muradin gets away though, and they killed four heroes here. Yeah, unbelievable. Wow. Okay. By the way, Suljin is still not done with his level 1. So I don't know who he didn't kill. I actually think it was Diablo that he didn't get yet. Because he was involved in pretty much any other kill I saw him around when Johanna was killed. I think it's Diablo. Diablo died after him. So it must be Dibbles. Li Ming, he got a kill against her single-handedly early on, as far as I remember. So it must be Divis at this point. But yeah, with that, we now have the push uh, onto the keep. They might try and end here, actually, because they're going to lose the keep at the top side right now. If they make that play, they need to end. And there's 10 seconds. That's plenty of time. Suljin isn't here, but everybody else is ready to rock and roll. And there's catapults also already on it. Ooh, but it could become a little bit dicey if they chase heroes, but they get it. Nice lockdown. Can they get that core destroyed though? That's the bigger question. Tacita, 60%. Catapults. They might have to move away here. They might have to move away. They lost the top. Whoa, 33. It's clutch. Catapults. Who kills the catapults? Kill the fucking catapults. Finally, they're down. 24%. The fight. The bloodlust to run away. 24%. Suljin. He has his R button. Suljin has his R button. And hit it, baby. Hit it. Yeah. <laughs> Murden jumps in and then this game. The home of peace. With a victory in the best of three. In Division 7, ladies and gentlemen.